Good morning. Welcome to a new day in our family of faith here at West Hills Baptist Church. It's a beautiful day outside. The, the air is getting a little bit crisper. I'm wearing my fall colors, and we're one week away from UT football. It's an exciting time. I'm so looking forward to it. You know, I'm so, um, uh, even though we can't meet together in person, there's always a silver lining. And, and one of the silver linings is that we have people joining us from several different states, and I'm so glad that we're able to welcome them in our midst as well. So I know that, 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 uh, that you would welcome them personally if you could. Uh, I want you to remember Janet Parkey in your prayers right now. She just lost her husband, Phil, and my good friend after a long battle, and I want her to be surrounded with our love and prayers during this time. She is such a, a special lady, and we're so sad to lose Phil, but he is no longer in pain, and we know where he is, and the time will come when we will place his remains in our memorial garden. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from 1 John. This is in the fourth chapter, and the subtitle is God is Love. It is a kind of flowery language, but really, with everything that's going on in our world right now, I, I don't think ever in my lifetime have these words been so important. Hear these words as if you're hearing them for the first time. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the, day, on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? God above us, God before us, God within us, be now between us a bridge across which your truth can pass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Well, anyone who has heard me preach over time has heard me talk about my days as a high school history teacher. What you have not heard me talk about as much are my experiences coaching during that time. I taught at five different high schools, and each time I interviewed, I would say this. I'd say, I want you to know that I enjoy coaching, but I'm not a coach first. I'm a teacher who happens to enjoy coaching. And they'd always nod their head, and they would write that down. But the bottom line of it was is that I wasn't going to be able to get the jobs if I had not been willing to coach, because social studies teachers were a dime a dozen. So I understood that I needed to coach, and that was okay. One year, I got suckered into being the assistant coach for the girls' softball team in Whitwell. And whoo, man, was I in up over my head. I mean, they were really good. We, we ended up finishing in the top 10 in the state, but I was just out of my league from the very beginning. For one thing, these girls got in a fight every single game. Every game. 
and they were not interested, in my opinion, on how ladies should conduct themselves. But as, as much as I tried to keep it from happening, the head coach of the team just fueled it. One day, we were playing over here at Coalfield High School, and sure enough, a fight broke out, and they finally got everybody separated. And our coach, who was very loud and animated, what he said to the girl on our team, who actually initiated, initially started the fight, uh, he said to her, you did the right thing. At which time, the opposing head coach, who was a woman, walked into their dugout and came back out with a bat. And they had to separate everybody all over again. Well, finally, the, the, the inning ended, and it was time for me to go uh, coach first base in front of their dugout. So I just stood in our dugout. <laughs> and the coach looked at me, he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm not doing anything. He said, go over there and coach first base. I said, coach, did you not just see that woman come out of there with a bat? <laughs> well, he finally talked me into going over there and coaching first base, and nothing else happened. My fears were relieved, but I kept an eye on that woman for the rest of the game. I want to share with you this morning a beautiful quote from Martin Luther, who was the seminal figure in the Reformation. It's a quote about faith, and it goes like this. Faith is a living, bold trust in God's grace. So certain in God's favor that it would risk death a thousand times trusting in it. Such confidence and knowledge in God's grace makes you happy and joyful and bold in your relationship to God and all creatures. That's just beautiful, isn't it? Sometimes when I hear something like that or come across something like that, I like to put it in my own words. This is how I would say it. Christianity includes a way of living so trusting in God's grace that our greatest fears are removed, even our fear of death. Christians have such confidence in our Creator and Redeemer that our relationship with Him causes us, causes us to be happy and joyful and bold in our relationship with Him and our relationships with everybody else. Those are hard words to live by in our present world, aren't they? Shouldn't we, as Christians, be the happiest people on the planet? I don't think that statement means that we're not aware of the suffering taking place in the world. I don't think that statement means that we should not be active in solving the problems of the world. I think we should be aware. I think we should always try to be a part of the solution and not the problem. Simultaneously, I think we should also be the most joyful people on the planet because of our trust in God's grace. But it sure does not feel like the Christians who make the news live up to those kinds of characteristics. It seems that the Christians who are upset the most get the most press. We know as people of God, we know that there is a power bigger than fear. Sometimes we just don't live it that way. We know that love is greater, we know that, but to some degree it seems as if we are living in a constant state of fear. I don't think that was ever God's intention, do you? Now let me be fair. The vast majority of us have never lived through times like these. Some of you are old enough to remember what it was like to live through the Great Depression and World War II and the threat of nuclear war. But the combination of climate change, the demand for racial justice, and this pandemic and all that's associated with it, that is just a recipe for a whole lot of fear unlike any time in history. Years ago, when I was in the youth group, our youth leader did a lot of different activities that made us think. It was a very unique approach, approach to ministry in a whole lot of ways. But I remember one time we were to choose from a long list of attributes which were most important to us. 
And for whatever reason, even in my crazy 13-year-old boy mind, because, you know, 13-year-old boys have brain damage, right? But anyway, for whatever reason, I came to the conclusion in this exercise that the attribute that I was most interested in that kept coming back to the top of my list was peace of mind. I now understand it differently. Looking back at how crazy it was growing up in my house in the 70s, it may have just been me wanting to get away from all the yelling, but to this day when I think of that list of attributes, I still choose peace of mind. But now I understand it at a much deeper level. It is a peace that comes from a lack of fear. Because we all live in this balance of having these fears, but also learning to embrace love, learning to be open to love, it's particularly hard to do in times like these. But we need to be reminded of it. How do you think God would have us to respond to everything that is happening? Out of fear? We have a lot to be worried about these days. But before I talk about some of that, I want to tell you what I remind myself about over and over again in my mind. I look back on the most stressful times in my life, and although I realized that they were very serious, God saw me through those days step by step. And I could have had more peace of mind in the midst of it if I had trusted God more. Some of my biggest life lessons sound like this. I let it get to me. I'm not ever going to let something like that get to me again. My confidence in God is growing bigger and stronger, not weaker. There's this incredible thing that Jesus can do. He can literally help us reinterpret our own experiences. And they no longer have to be obstacles that keep us from moving forward in life. Those same events can be reinterpreted and no longer be seen as obstacles, but be seen as stepping stones to a deeper relationship with God and a life with a deeper sense of peace. Martin Luther also said this, he said, pray and let God worry. Man, that is so easy to say and so difficult to do. Yet we as Christians know that the first story in Genesis with this beautiful imagery of the Creator hovering over the chaos and making something out of nothing and then hovering over the chaos and causing order to come of it and causing it to become something beautiful, causing it to look like the place where we live right here in Tennessee. That is such a beautiful picture to paint. And yet we all know that there are many people out there who try to undo that beauty, try to undo the order, especially in our current climate. There are people who are trying to turn our world back into chaos. However, there are many of us who are fighting against that and doing everything we can to bring the order back from the chaos. And the ones who we should be grateful to God for are the scientists. Never in my lifetime have I seen scientists all around the world working on a cure for one thing without money being the driving force? It's been done before for things like polio, but in my lifetime, I have never seen more people with one goal in mind like this. Earlier, I told you you didn't hear much about my coaching days in my sermons. Today, I'm going to tell you about my days in the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm going to tell you what it was like from a sales perspective. You'll understand why. A big part of big pharma culture is to talk about and get excited about the drugs that are in the pipeline. Obviously, because 
people were hoping to make a lot of money off them once they were approved by the FDA. Sometimes these drugs made it through clinical trials and were approved and sick people got better and physicians were able to do their jobs better and people made a lot of money in the process. When that happens, it's great for everybody. But from time to time, one of these drugs would get close and not make it. It wouldn't be as effective as they hoped or maybe the side effects are worse than they thought. Lots of other reasons. But the reasons were not determined by the money. The reasons were determined by the data and the facts and the, and the scientists who are driven by them. And that's exactly how it should work. We have to have people who are driven by facts. Thank God for them. This past week, the top communications director for the Department of Health and Human Services accused government scientists, the people who are working on a cure for the coronavirus, he accused them of sedition. Do you know what that means? It means he accused them of being of insurrection against our country. How did we get here? How in the world are the people trying to find a cure based on the truth being accused of anything? Well, before I go any further, scientists are not perfect. They are people, and people make mistakes from time to time. But by and large, these people have made our world a much, much safer place. If you think our world is upside down now, Imagine what our world would be like without vaccines, without science. And yet somehow we find ourselves in a place where these people are being threatened. If we as Christians are honestly in a search for the truth in life, we cannot be a part of stuff like that. It is based on fear, and we worship a God of love. So before I talk about the passage that we read this morning, let me just be very clear what this vaccine is going to look like once it gets here. First of all, it's not likely to be perfect. Second of all, it is reasonable not to be the first to get it. But remember, thousands of people will have had it in the clinical trials, and the vast majority of us will not even have the opportunity to be first in line. People who work in the medical field will be prioritized, and it should be that way. By the time we have the opportunity, we will be much better informed. So yes, I'm going to get the vaccine because it will be based on science and not some ridiculous conspiracy theory. And it will be for the greater good of all people, just like the polio vaccine was. Hundreds of thousands of lives are going to be saved because of it. And we, have, and we have people who are in an honest journey for the truth to thank for it. Now let me put this in a different light. Everybody has people in their lives that bring peace. And everybody has people in their lives that bring chaos. I don't believe... Any person is all one without the other. I, th I believe we are all a mixture of light and darkness. But just like there are people that you know are deep down good-hearted people who are just full of light, there are also people who are not interested in the greater good and wish to cause division and sow chaos. And they are successful at it when they are able to do it by nothing more than planting a seed in our minds. There is a way to live with the kind of boundaries that do not draw us into the destruction. But we have to recognize it for what it is. And we have to learn to allow our search for the truth to be based on love, not fear. This morning... I want to share a story with you that is reflective of just how far this kind of thing can go. Decades ago, there was a man who lived in a small town in the Midwest and who had run a market next to a railroad track for years and years, and he had a reputation 
for being one of the finest Christian men in town. The men had two grown sons, and when World War II broke out, no one in the town was surprised that they immediately enlisted to serve our country. When the two sons came home from the war victorious, they were like heroes in their town. And because the man was so proud of his sons, he decided to retire early and allow his two fine sons to run the family business. Everybody in the town celebrated with him, and for 20 years they ran that store successfully, and each of them had an excellent reputation in the community. One day, one of the brothers was opening the store, and a couple came in and bought something for a dollar. And because he had not yet opened the register, he simply placed the dollar bill on top of the register and walked these people out to their car. And when he came back in, the dollar bill was missing. A few minutes later, the other brother came in to work, and the brother said to him, Did you see a dollar bill sitting here on the register? And he said, No, I didn't see anything. I just got here. So the brother who put it there started trying to think of how this must have happened, trying to put the pieces together in his mind. And later on that morning, he asked again, Are you sure you haven't seen that dollar bill? And the other brother said, are you insinuating that I'm being dishonest about it? And the seed was planted. That night, they could not enjoy their dinner together. They began to see that their relationship had changed, and one began saying things about the other, and the other responded likewise, and they just couldn't stop themselves. The time came when they put a divider down the middle of that store and began to try to convince people in the town to do their business on one side of the store and not the other because my brother is not who he claims to be. 20 years later, a car drives up with out-of-state tags. A man steps out and walked into the closest store and he walked in and he said, excuse me, may I ask you a question? Can you tell me how long you have run this store and the brother said well this side of it for 20 years but I've been here for 40 years and the man said then you are the man I need to talk to he said 20 years ago I was down on my luck and I was walking down those railroad tracks out there and as I approached your store I noticed some people walking out to the parking lot and when I looked in the back door I noticed a one dollar bill sitting on the register I've never been a person to take things that are not mine, but I was really hungry that day, so I took the dollar and bought something to eat. But that day has weighed on my heart all of these years. May I give you $100? And he pulled out a $100 bill and he said, will it make up for what I did all those years ago? And the brother said, would you mind going with me next door and repeating that story. These two brothers came to the realization that day what one dollar and a seed of suspicion can do to people who claim to love each other. Let me ask you a question. Was one brother more at fault than the other? In this Old Testament passage that we read this morning, there is this brilliant portrayal of the first people having this relationship with God, and a serpent comes along and plants a seed. And instead of God coming down to the garden to walk with them and talk with them, just like they had done all of those times before, they hid from God. They took the word of a snake and allowed that seed to be planted. Can you see why this is the first story? All it took for them to change their minds about the creator who loved them was the word of a snake and for one person to start believing it. I end up saying to people sometimes, I say, I wish things could be different. I wish things could be different. I wish someone had not taken the word of someone whose intention was to divide. What we believe as Christians is that Jesus came to undo what happened so long ago. I love how one theologian put it. He said, Jesus 
was God's answer to a bad reputation. He wanted us to see what love could really look like. Love outside of fear and suspicion. Did you notice in the news this week, there was an article with the title, America's Devastating Divorce from Science. How did we get here? Where does this end? Where does not believing in science end? Why would we trade something that has served us so well for something that history has judged so harshly? Let me tell you what it was like to get vaccinated in the 70s when I was a little boy. You didn't go to the doctor's office. You went to the school gym and stood in line. And the doctor was up there with something that looked like a drill. And it wasn't a syringe. It was like this big handheld device. And you had to listen to each kid get it. Boom. Ha! Ah! And then you take a step up in line. And then you hear it again. Boom. Ha! Ah! It was traumatizing. And I remember, you know, my mom holding my hand, dragging me up there. Boom. Ah! <laughs> Not my favorite memory. But one which was necessary for me and the greater good of our country. I understand that scientists and pharmaceutical companies are not perfect. And that some of the people speaking on their behalf of them these days are deeply flawed. But the vast majority of scientists are excellent at what they do and they are trying to do the right thing. And I don't buy the conspiracy theories that are running rampant on the internet these days. When we embrace suspicion and allow it to take seed, great harm follows, not just in the government, but in the relationships with people that God has placed in our path. We have the option and we have the opportunity to learn how to spread love and not fear. Listen to this quote. Fear has a way of destroying and dehumanizing what trust and love have created. Hear that again. Fear has a way of destroying and dehumanizing what trust and love have created. Doesn't it make sense to you that what Christ has done for Christians is exactly what that stranger did for those two brothers? Jesus came to say that the snake was wrong. Nobody should have bought that in the first place. But God proved through the risen Christ that we can move forward in life with trust and love and not fear and suspicion how big could that be in our lives right now what is the truth behind the scripture that we read today when you worship a god of love you can remove all fear all fear perfect love cast out fear but let's be honest perfect fear can cast out love, but it is not as powerful, it's not even close to what perfect love can do for us. Keeping our hearts open for what God can do, that is an incredible gift. And we have it within us to live either way. Perfect love can cast out fear and change the world, or perfect fear can cast out love and change the way we live. Perfect love can cast out fear and change the world for the better. There is nothing that perfect love cannot handle. What else does God have to do for our fears to be relieved? Do you want more peace of mind in your world in 2020? Pray and let God worry. As you go out into the world, take the kind of peace that can only come from God with you. The world needs it. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. 
love all people and rejoice in the power of the Spirit. And may the blessings of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you forever.